مجتمعهم بقوام الله اللهم صل على محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا يسر ولا تعسر وتمن بالخير وبك نستعين يا فتاة سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم First of all, we give our praise and our thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the favors and bounties Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed on us and we send salat and salam on his last and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as we continue with the seerah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in our last session we were discussing the battle of Balar still and we stopped at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam returning to Medina with the captives at Safra, he distributed the spoils of war and he took along all the other captives except for two, as we mentioned, two of them were killed and the remaining, which would have been 68 of them, were taken back to Medina and when he reached Medina, he put different captives as the responsibility of other Ansars because there was no prison, there was no jail at that time so in order to keep them and monitor them, they were chained, they were tied up because they were prisoners. But different Ansars and different Muhajir were in charge to make sure that they have food, make sure that they are treated well until the decision comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what should they do with their captives? So in that period of time, so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he returned to Medina and he do this distribution for the, a temporary distribution and he get the news that his daughter has passed away as you mentioned last week so he goes to the cemetery where his daughter is buried Ruqayya radiallahu anha and not only him but a lot of the women folks followed him she was already buried two to three days before he reached into Medina because he stayed in Badr for three days after the battle had come to an end. So when he reached there, she's no more there. She's in the cemetery already buried. He went there and he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we all know, the dua of the Prophet is accepted. So he made dua for his daughter. And the women folks that would have been relatives related to Ruqayya, the daughter of the Prophet وسلم, they started to cry. And Umar who was there said to them, do not cry stop them from crying and the prophet sallam, said to him leave them let them allow them to cry because they were not pulling up their their crude or they were not wailing they were just merely crying and the prophet sallam, says it is okay to cry someone dear has passed away you're allowed to shed some tears you're allowed to cry what is prohibited is beating yourself up hitting yourself in your face, hitting yourself on your, your chest and trying to pull off your clothes and those kind of things. I wanted to jump in the, in, the, in the grave with the individual. All of these kind of things is not permissible. But the actual crying, that was permissible. So he told Umar anhu to allow them to weep, allow them to cry for the death of Ruqayya radiallahu anha. After a few days passed, so the, the captives were still there in the care. They were looking, they were observing how the companions were treating them. And when they lo saw the good and the kind treatment they were getting from the companions, many of them started to think or contemplate about accepting Islam. Many of them, just by the treatment they were given by the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah has given you a choice if you want you could behead all of them and if you want you could free them you could take a ransom and free them whichever one you want so this is a choice given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if he kills all of them he's not wrong Allah give him that choice 
if he takes the ransom and frees them, he is also doing the right thing because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him the choice. But before making that decision, he calls his companions. And this is how the Prophet used to operate. Even though he had the decision in his hands, he could have said, what I want to do, I want to behead everyone or I want to take a ransom. This is a choice given to me, but he did not work in a dictatorship. He called the companions and he had a mashura, a consultation. And he asked them, what do you think we should do with the captives? Abdullah bin Rawaha, he said, let us all, let us take the captives, place them in a valley and burn all of them. Burn all of them, kill them. This was his decision. Umar anhu said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let us behead all of them. But before we behead them, let every single one of us who has family who are captive, let them kill their own family. So for example, if one of your family member was taken as a captive and you're a Muslim, his opinion is let your own family member get the opportunity to kill your family, behead them, to show that we have no connection with kufr and disbelief, to show that we will not going to feel sorry if they do not want to accept the Islam. And then Abu Bakr he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we could take a ransom. And by taking the ransom, it is one that is going to help us because we could use that money to prepare ourselves for the next battle. Because the unbelievers lost, but they're not going to stop there. Definitely they're going to want to take revenge. And we need to be prepared. So if you ransom them, we have some money, we can prepare ourselves better for when the next battle comes as well as when we ransom them, they are going to feel ashamed. They are going to feel embarrassed because they had to pay for their freedom after coming out with all that pride and arrogance to fight. In order for them to be released, they had to pay money in order to get their freedom. So there's going to be humiliation on them. And he says, thirdly, they are going to accept, some of them might even accept Islam. So instead of beheading them, who knows which one of them are going to be Muslims. And a few of them, well, did become Muslims. So this was his opinion. So these were the three opinions given to the Prophet The Prophet did not even consider the first opinion, which is to burn them. Because it is haram to use fire as a form of punishment. You cannot burn anything, any living thing. It is not allowed to use fire as a form of punishment. That is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to use. Then he said to Abu Bakr, who he says, Oh Abu Bakr, you are like Ibrahim alayhi salam. And you are like Jesus alayhi salam. Because what Ibrahim alayhi salam says, فَمَنْ تَبِعَنِي فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي وَمَنْ عَصَانِي فَإِنَّكَ غَفُورُ رَحِيمٌ This is what Ibrahim alayhi salam said to Allah. He says, O Allah, whoever follows me, he's from me. He's a believer. He's with me. Waman asani and whoever disobeys me, whoever has kufr and disbelief, fa inna ka ghafur rahim. Allah, you're the most forgiving. You can forgive them if you want. He was not harsh with them. He says, Jesus alayhi salam said similar thing. Jesus alayhi salam says, into aqdibuhum fa inna hum ibad. Says to Allah, oh Allah, if you were to punish them, which are those who consider him to be the Son of God, Allah asks him in Surah Al Ma'idah, Did you tell the people to worship you and your mother as two gods from besides Allah? Jesus says, I never said something like that. If I had said it, you definitely would have known. But he says, Oh Allah, if you want to punish them, they are your servants. You have the choice. They are your servant. And if you forgive them, you are the mighty, you are the most wise. So this was Jesus response with regards to the Christians, those who are taking him as gods from besides Allah. So he's saying the Prophet is saying Abu Bakr has the qualities of Ibrahim and he has the qualities of Jesus. He says to Umar. 
His opinion was, behead them, kill all of them. He says, oh Omar, your opinion is like that of Musa alayhi salam and like that of Nuh alayhi salam. You have qualities like Musa. Musa and Nuh alayhi salam, they were very harsh, they were very stern. He says, Musa alayhi salam says, Rabbana tmis ala amwalihim wajdur ala qulubihim fala yu'minu hatta yarwal adhab al-alim. He says that Musa alayhi salam says, Oh Allah, destroy their wealth. This was the dua Musa alayhi salam is making for his people. Those who are disbelievers, who Allah destroy their wealth and tie, seal their hearts and let none of them believe until they see the painful punishment in front of them. Let them only acknowledge you when they actually feel that punishment. This is what Musa alayhi salam says. And he says, as for Nuh alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam says, Rabbi la tadar ala al-ardi min al-kafirina dayyara. He says, O oh Allah, do not leave any unbelievers on the face of the earth. O oh Allah, when this flood come, make sure every single one of them is killed. This is the dua of Nuh alayhi salam. He says, Umar anhu, you are just like Nuh and you are just like Musa alayhi salam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he is rahmatulil alameen. He is the mercy of the world. And whenever he was given a choice, something which is difficult and something which is easy, he will always take the easy way as a form of being lenient for his people. So when he was given that option and then Abu Bakr anhu has taken the option of ransom, the Prophet wasallam, he also accepted the ransom. He agreed that a ransom should be paid and then they should be freed. But many of the believers, when the decision were making about the, the captives, they were worried. Because if the Prophet ﷺ was to accept Umar anhu's decision, then they have nothing. Right now they own, the, these captives are considered to be possession. You could keep them as your slave. And if you have them as your slave, you could also sell them and get money for them. So now they are the ones who have captured the captives. So these are considered to be their possession. Now if they are beheaded, they have nothing to get. All your wealth has gone down the drain. You are not going to get back anything for the captives. But when they heard Abu Bakr anhu's opinion, even though Abu Bakr had the best of intention when he was making that opinion, many of the companions, they found that this is the best opinion because at least we are going to get something for our slaves. We are going to get something for the captives. Allah says, Turiduna arada dunya. Allah was angry because of them thinking about the dunya instead of thinking about Allah and thinking about the akhirah. They were only studying about what they could get back from the slaves or from the captives. Allah says to Riduna Arada Dunya. They were only thinking about the dunya. Wallahu read al Akhira. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He was thinking about the hereafter. Allah wanted to give them the hereafter. Allah says, Laula kitabu min Allah sabaqa la masakum fima khastum adabun adim. Allah says, if it wasn't because of a previous decree, Allah would have punished them. That previous decree was anyone who participated in the battle of Badr, Allah is not going to punish them. This was a decree before the battle of Badr. Also another promise that Allah had promised them that whoever participated in the battle of Badr, Allah is going to forgive them. So their forgiveness was already predetermined even before the battle of Badr. So even though afterwards they had that greed now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm angry because of the greed, but I'm going to overlook it because of what I have destined even before the battle of Badr. The amount of ransom was dependent upon each individual. They would look at the kind of individual, the status the individual have, how much wealth he has, and then they would accept a ransom depending on the individual. There were some who, some of the ransom was from 1,000 to 4,000 dirhams. So some people, some of them maybe 2,000, some of them 3,000, like, like that, from 1,000 
to 4,000. There were some who were very poor and they didn't have money to ransom themselves and their tribe are not going to come and help to pay the ransom. So for these people, the opinion came and the Prophet Sallallahu accepted that was to let them teach the Muslims how to read and write. You don't have no money to pay the ransom, take 10 children or 10 persons from the believers, teach the 10 persons to read and write. As soon as all 10 know how to read and write, you are free, you are allowed to go. This was an option given to those who didn't have any wealth, who didn't have any money. And for others who did not know to read and write, there were some captives, they were poor, they had no money, as well as they didn't know to read and write as well. For those, they were allowed to go. They were allowed their freedom. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he freed them. When the news reached Makkah of the defeat, an announcer came in and he says, Utba is killed, Shaiba is killed, Abu Jahal is killed, Umayya is killed. Zama'a is killed, Nabiha is killed, Munabih is killed. All of these were chiefs. So when they heard that, there was great panic in Makkah. All of them were very worried now, they were very sad. Even at this moment, it is mentioned, it is at this time after the news that Abu Lahab, he also got the plague on his skin, the sickness on his skin, and he also died at that moment. For an entire month, the Quraysh mourned what took place in the Battle of Badr. For an entire month, they were sad and they were crying, they were weeping. And when they heard that the Muslims are going to free the, those who are captives with the ransom, this each tribe started to send the money to free their own members of their tribe. And like that, many of them were freed. Amongst those who were captured, there was Abdul Az bin Rabi. Abul As, sorry, Abul As bin Rabi, he was the son-in-law of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was married to Zainab Radiallahu Anha, which is one of the daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Khadija Radiallahu Anha, she had a lot of respect for Abul As. And she was the one that asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for her daughter Zainab Radiallahu Anha to get married to Abul As. And they got married before prophethood. So the two of them got married when there was no Islam as yet. So both of them were, as you can say, unbelievers at that time. And when prophethood came, Abu Al-As, he was very rich, he was honest, he was a trader. And after the prophethood, and he remained with his wife, Zainab Radira Anha. He did not want a divorce. The Quraysh used to laugh at him. And they used to say to him, why don't you divorce her? She have rejected the religion of your forefathers and you are still married to her. Look at what the two sons of Abu Lahab did. The two sons of Abu Lahab, Utbah and Utayba, they were married to two daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu and Umm Kulthum. And as soon as Islam came, Abu Lahab told them, you have to divorce. You can't keep them as your wife. They have a different religion. So they were forcing him as well, Abu As, they were forcing him to divorce Zainab Anha. And he would say to them that there's no other woman that could compare to Zainab Anha. Even though she had a different religion than me, I cannot divorce her. This is the amount of love that he had for his wife Zainab. In the Battle of Badr, he was one of those who were forced he did not want to come and fight. But he was forced by Abu Jahal that you must go in the Battle of Badr. And because of him not coming with the intention of fight, it was very easy for them to capture him. Because he was not trying to defend himself or anything, he was just waiting for them to take him. So when he was captured and his wife, Zainab, she was still in Makkah. When she heard about the ransom, she didn't have any money to go and free him. All that she had was a necklace that her mother Khadija Radila Anha had given to her as a gift when she got married. So she took this necklace as a priceless necklace. 
and she's thinking, I have to free my husband. This is the only thing I have. So she sent the necklace with some of the people to Medina. When the Prophet Sallallahu he saw the necklace, his eyes was filled with tears. He started to remember his wife Khadija radiallahu anha. And he said to the companions, he asked them, if you do not mind, can I return this necklace to its rightful owner? And could I allow this captive to be freed as well? Now remember, he is the leader, he is the messenger. He didn't want it look as though this is my son-in-law, I'm going to free him just like that. This is my decision. He told the companions, you decide for me. You make that decision. If, you, or if all of you give the okay, only then I'm going to do that. If you have a problem with it, he will have to remain here. I'm not going to allow him to be freed. And all the companions, they give the okay. So the Prophet Sallallahu said to Abu'l-As, you're going to be freed, but on the condition that you return Zainab radiallahu anha, send Zainab radiallahu anha to Medina. I want her living in Medina. I don't want her to remain in Makkah. So he accepted that condition, he was freed, and he went to Makkah. As soon as he reached Makkah, he told her the condition that he had made, that you have to go with your father in Medina. She was happy. She went with Kinana. Kinana was one of her relatives. And they mounted their animal during the day and they were leaving to go to Medina. The other leaders of the Quraysh saw they, that these two were leaving for Medina. They came and they stopped them. And they said to them that we have no reason to stop you from going to Medina. But the manner of how you're doing it, you're acting too brazenly. You're doing it in the open as if nothing is wrong with it. If you want to leave, then leave in the darkness of the night. Don't leave like this. So they went back into Mecca, waited until the night, and then they started their journey to Medina. The Prophet sent Haris and another Ansar at a place called Batnu Yajuj. And he told him that whenever Kinana reaches there at that place, which is Batnu Yajuj, that he should, they should take Zainab Radila Anha and bring her to Medina. So she reached into Medina, she started to live in Medina, whilst her husband, he remained in Makkah. And it so happened that one time he was on a caravan from Syria and the Muslims came out and they captured the caravan. When they captured the caravan, he was able to escape. And when he escaped, he reached in Medina and he went straight to Zainab. He was still an unbeliever. He reached and he went to Zainab and she gave him security. Nobody else knew that he reached into Medina. He went and he went straight to her, her room and she kept him in the room. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came out for Fajr in the morning, Zainab anha says that Abu al-As have been given security by me. She made an announcement loud so that everyone could hear. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was shocked. He said, he turned to the companions and he said to them, did you all hear what I just heard? They said, yes, we heard what she was saying. The Prophet said to the Sahaba that I had no idea of this. I did not know that he was here hiding in our room. And then he said to the companions, all of you know the relationship I have with him. All of you know the relationship I have with him. If you want, you could return it, return his goods to him and allow him to leave. This is what he asked the companions. And then he went to the room of Zainab and he said to her, you have done a good thing by giving him security, but you cannot be intimate with him anymore. Because before, while he was in Makkah, the law of getting married to an unbeliever did not come down as yet. Only in Medina, that law came down. So now there was no nikah again between the two of them. He's haram for her at this moment. So he says to, to her, you cannot be intimate with her and allow him to go back to Makkah, he's going to be safe. 
So Abul As, he took all the goods, all the companions came and they gave him the goods, and he took that and he went back to Makkah. When he reached Makkah, he distributed all that he had to give to whoever he, he had owed, whatever debt he had. And then he proclaimed, he recited the Shahada. He said to all of them, I am a Muslim. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And he said, I wanted to be a Muslim even while I was in Medina. While I was hiding there, I wanted to be a Muslim. But because I fear that you might say that I'm going to steal your goods because the companions had already captured the goods. Because you might say that I wanted to deceive you with your goods, I did not accept Islam. I came, make sure I give everyone what is deserving to them, and now I've accepted Islam, and he went to Medina. When he reached to Medina, and he told the Prophet ﷺ of his acceptance of Islam, the Prophet wasallam got both of them renegged. As you can see, they got back married and decided to live with one another. Another companion who was captive was Abbas Abbas who was the uncle of the Prophet he was also forced to come out in the battle. And when he was captured, the Prophet wasallam in the night, he couldn't sleep properly. Because he said to the companions, I'm hearing the shackles on Abbas and it is pain in me. So the companions came and they took off the shackles from him, but they were still watching him and monitoring him. And the Prophet was able to sleep. The next day, the companions came to the Prophet and said to him, If it is paining you so much that we have Abbas, we are ready to free him without any ransom. The Prophet he knew that Abbas had money. So if he has money, then he's not allowed to be freed without paying a ransom. So he said to the companions, no, you make sure you take every single dirham from him. Make sure you take the full amount from him. Abbas said to the Prophet I'm a Muslim. I, was already, I had already accepted Islam. So now everyone thinks, even the Prophet says, I do not know. But if you say you was already a Muslim, then Allah knows best about your Islam. What is apparent is that you are a captive at this moment and you have to pay the ransom and only then you'll be free and you could be a Muslim from then on. He said to the Prophet I don't have no money to pay. I don't have any money that I could pay any ransom. The Prophet he said to him, what about the money the dirhams that you and your wife, Ummu Fadl, buried in your home. The two of them secretly, nobody knew about that. Two of them secretly buried some money. And he told his wife, Ummu Fadl, that in case anything was to happen to me, use this to take care of my children. So this was only between husband and wife alone. Nobody knew about that. When the Prophet said that to him, he says, I swear by Allah, you are a prophet of Allah. Because nobody knew that conversation. Nobody knew that we bury that money. It is impossible for you to actually know what took place between me and Umu Fadl. Because the Prophet was not in Makkah. He was in Medina all the time. So for him to be able to know what was happening in that room is impossible. And then Abbas who he says to the Prophet wasallam, the during the battle, twenty aukia was taken away from me. In the ransom, could you deduct the amount that was taken away from me in the battle, and I'm going to pay the balance for the ransom? The Prophet wasallam, he says, whatever we took from you in the battle, it is a gift from Allah that can be counted as part of the ransom. The ransom is something separate. You have to pay that separately. And then it so happened that he paid and he was freed. This is how he was given his freedom. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an ayat in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That whatever Allah has taken away from him, Allah is going to give him better than that. 
So, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did replace for Abbas anhu better than what he had given up. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him 20 slaves. And not only that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. So he got back better than the wealth that he had given, as well as he got forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was just one incident that took place with the, in the life of Abbas anhu. Some wealth was brought from Bahrain. And the Prophet وسلم, told the companions to put it in a masjid. We're going to distribute that after the salat. And the Prophet وسلم, went straight, performed his salat. After the salat, he came and he sat there and he started to distribute. Anyone that passed by, he would give them something. Until he sat there, until every single dollar, every single dirham was finished, nothing was remaining. While he was distributing, Abbas who came, his uncle, and he said to the Prophet give me some. In the battle of Badr, I had to pay my own ransom. And because I had to pay my ransom, give me some, some of what was brought from Bahrain. The Prophet said, take. Abbas was happy. He took his clothes and he started to pack, pack wealth upon wealth in his clothes. So much so, then he was, when he finished, he tried to lift it and he couldn't lift it. It was too heavy. He said to the Prophet وسلم, ask somebody to help me. Call one of the other companions, ask them to just give me a lift up so that I can move with it. The Prophet وسلم, says, no. Then he said to the Prophet وسلم, well, you give me a hand. You give me a hand just to raise it up and I will be able to, to move along with it. The Prophet وسلم, says, no. And Abbas وسلم, he put it down. And he took out a few things. And then when he was able to lift it by himself, he took it and he gone. He started to walk. The Prophet ﷺ was watching at him. The Prophet ﷺ didn't move his gaze from Abbas. And he kept on watching in the direction. Look at this man. And he was so amazed. Look at how greedy. Look at how greedy this man can be for wealth. That he, he's taking that among that he can't even lift by himself. So this was Abbas and who he was, as you mentioned, he was freed. This is one of the captives. There are a few other captives that we'll deal with, inshallah, next week. And we'll try our best to complete the Battle of Badr, all of the details of the Battle of Badr next week, inshallah. And complete the other few. There's only a few more things that took place in the second year after Hijrah. So we hope, inshallah, that next week we could finish off with the second year after Hijrah, inshallah. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallahu wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik subhana rabbika rabbil